been a great year. Today we've got multi-generational recruitment as a topic and I'm happy to introduce Mary Wagner. Mary, who is with At Work. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Anita. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for having me, allowing At Work to, uh, to host this session on generational recruiting. Um, this is a topic that I'm by no means a subject matter expert. However, with six, um, representing six states with hundreds of clients and thousands of employees, we do put quite a bit of time, energy, and money um, into air recruiting efforts. So I'm excited to be able to talk to you guys about the importance of a good placement for your company, what that means for your business success, and how every hire, every great new hire starts with a recruitment process. So a little bit about At Work. We are an employer solutions staffing service. Um, our desire is to understand your business, your needs, and your challenges. Um, we want to work together to develop a strategy that's going to optimize your recruiting, your staffing, and the retention of your organization. That's our goal. Um, we are locally owned and operated. Um, we have 29 locations throughout the six states listed. My contact information, I would be happy to discuss this topic further with you. Um, it's my understanding that the PowerPoint will be aware to those attend or be available to those attending today. Um, I have cards here if you'd like to uh, uh, receive any of those. Be glad to talk to you further regarding this or any employment and recruitment process. Okay, so just some food for thought to get us started here. Um, the first quote, the children now love luxury. They have had, they have bad manners, contempt for authority. They show disrespect for elders and love chatter in places of exercise. This might be something that uh, you would hear baby boomers saying in regards to millennials. Um, however, this quote is attributed to Socrates. Um, of course, that's somewhat debatable. The, the online world, you can't believe everything. You know, um, Abraham Lincoln invented the internet according to the internet, but um, there is some debate about where these quotes originated, but this first quote was seen in print as early as 1907 um, that we can find documented, and it, it was then contributed to Socrates. Um, the second is attributed to a sermon given by Peter the Hermit in 1274. The young people of today think of nothing but themselves. They have no reverence for parents or old age. They are impatient of all restraint. They talk as if they knew everything, and what passes for wisdom with us is foolishness with them. So in sharing these uh, quotes with you, my goal is to ask you to open your mind. Um, <clears throat> historically, there's been some disdain for from older generations to their, their counterparts, the younger generation. So I'd ask that you just be rid of any preconceived notions, any thoughts about other generations, because I truly believe that great companies are the result of inclusion. Um, and when we engage all generations into air thought leadership, we'll see better ideas and more creativity as organizations. So what we're gonna to cover today is uh, we're gonna define what the generations are. Um, we're gonna look at some commonly recognized characteristics of each generational group. We'll also um, discuss the numbers, and then we'll talk a little bit about how to recruit, where to recruit, and the role, finally, of retention and engagement. Um, if you have a revolving door um, re uh, retention pl plan, your recruitment process is gonna be more and more difficult. So in order to retain the employees that you have, we'll touch on that for a moment. All right, defining the generations. In some form, generational roles in the, um, in the work workforce have been creating quite the buzz. I've attended sessions recently um, that have talked about communicating more effectively um, throughout generations and keeping up with the technology and changing workforce. What we're gonna do to fill the skills gap um, so there's been lots of talk that comes back to this one common factor, which is uh, the generations in the workforce and how can we better leverage and utilize the talent that we have. So I encourage you in this constantly changing world of work to embrace and encourage um, each generation represented by your workforce, allow them to spread their wings and bring what they do best to the table. 
<laughs> All right. Oh, I think I went too far. Let me back up here. Sorry about that. So the first group of um, that we're going to look at is the traditionalists. Traditionalists are now beyond 70 years old in the workforce. Um, they are, um, you know, the, the smallest group that we currently have, but there are still traditionalists in our workforce. We have baby boomers, um, which they vary in age from 56 to 70 years old. And we have Generation Xers um, who are between the ages of 36 to 55. And then we have the Millennials, um, which some of the research will show these, this Millennial group as the Generation Y and the Generation Z. Um, but we refer to them collectively as the Millennials uh, for the most part. So let's uh, go ahead and we'll slip, skip over to this one. Recognizing the characteristics of each generational group. Um, let's talk about the traditionalist first. Um, traditionalists, again, are those folks that were born um, prior to 1945. Th these folks would be characterized as loyal. Um, you know, a lot of your traditionalists retired from the company that they started working with. These are folks that stay with an employer as long as the employer stays with them, per se. Um, very committed to, to their employer. They are self-sacrificing. They're frugal, they're very family oriented, they value authority, and they want a top-down management approach. They want to follow the chain of command, um, and they are hardworking. And I would say that to, to say that there's a mentality for the traditionalists, it's make do or do without. And some of you may be thinking, you know, grandparents, folks like that, you, you make do or you do without. They dislike rules and structure. Um, they dislike slow processes, and they dislike micromanaging and lengthy conversations. Um, so this is some of the very uh, broad generalities of Generation X. Okay, moving on to Millennials. Probably the most talked about generation that, that um, any of us have heard mentioned, um, you know, in the in the recent day, or I guess past year, it's been a lot about millennials, the new technology, the new movements, the new everything is, is being driven by what seems to be the millennials, which is a very powerful generation coming up, uh, not only in the United States, but throughout the world. Um, and this group of individuals is very technologically advanced. They are fast paced and highly connected, um, highly connected to each other and the world around them. You know, they, they know how to use all of them capabilities of these iPhones and other, you know, smartphones with um, crazy ease. Um, they have a need for immediacy. They do not like if you cannot answer um, questions fast, give them decisions um, and information. They have been used to being able to get information immediately. So they like the need for immediacy. That's very important to your millennials. Um, they are the most diverse workforce. Um, you know, I read, I don't know if this is actually um, a fact, but I read that um, one out of every four millennials entering the workforce is a minority. So we have the most diverse population coming into the workforce than we've ever seen before. So inclusion um, and having diversity practices and, um, you know, making sure that we are we are where we need to be as HR professionals with their um, policies and so forth is very important for the group of millennials as well. Um, they have a high self-esteem. Um, they generally feel like they, they know and they understand what they're doing and they don't, you know, necessarily like for that to be called into question. Um, they're very task and project driven and they like seeing an end. And I saw a comparison that made sense to me. We're talking about the group of folks that, you know, when they, when they were growing up, they, these are the gaming, this is the gaming generation. So they were able to beat Bowser and rescue the princess. There was an end to that task. They liked being able to see an end in, in ahead of them. Um, so if they're working a very mundane, uh, repetitive type task, that's gonna become very boring for them, lose their interest, and they're not gonna feel like they're bringing value. So that's something to kind of think of and keep in mind when, when talking in generalities about the millennials. 
Um, they're very innovative and optimistic. Um, they like for you to challenge them with a problem, especially if it's for that mundane task, especially if it's for something that's repetitive and is just causing numerous work hours to go into completing this thing over and over and over again. How can we innovate um, and make this easier for everyone? So that is um, a trait of the millennials. Also, they tend to challenge the status quo um, and authority. And, um, you know, I have a 20 year old and I would say that that's true. Um, she, with her, she wants to know, well, why does it have to be that way? And me saying, well, that's just how I want it done. is not always the answer that she likes to hear. So there is a bit of challenge for status quo and authority, but we also have a millennial on our executive leadership team at at work that has really challenged our processes and said, this is not the best use of our time. Let's look for ways to build more efficiency in. Um, and we need that as, as companies and as teams um, working together, we need someone that's willing to take a fresh look at how we're doing things and say, this could be so much better. So, um, and they have the, the mentality of, I own my career. This, this is my life, my job. I will decide what value I'm gonna bring and what's gonna benefit uh, me. So the millennials like being able to multitask. They like having multiple opportunities to, to work on projects. They like technology, social media. They like to focus on results um, and they like advancement opportunities. Um, and they dislike long hours. They dislike being treated as a child. They dislike the focus of a company being on tenure. Um, and they dislike face-to-face -face interaction. Um, you know, an, an, an example that I can tell you about going back to my 20 year old is if the phone rings and it's her name, my answer is what's wrong? Because I'm used to a text message. I'm used to FaceTime when she really wants to talk to me. Um, so if her name pops up on my phone and it's a phone call, I'm like, oh, worst case scenario, what's wrong? So they tend to want to, let me text you when you're available, you can respond. Let me, you know, FaceTime you if we really want some face-to-face -face interaction. Um, so those are some of the characteristics of millennials. Great group of folks, great ideas, um, but it's different than we have historically been used to in the workforce. Okay. This, um, uh oh, went the wrong way. This next chart is also just a, uh, a little uh, slide that kind of tells a little bit about the um, different characteristics. I think we've touched on most all of these from the generations, even to the point of, you can see um, with the, this one calls it matures World War II, I, I would refer to them as traditionalist, um, you know, the suit and tie kind of mentality, you know, very, very dressed for success appearance. Um, the baby boomers, um, probably somewhat the same, same focus, same way. And then you see the Generation X connected to the phone, wearing the shorter skirts and the long boots. And then you kind of got your, your Generation um, Y or your millennials, that's more um, what's comfortable, what's, in, what, what's good for me now. All right, moving on, the next topic that we'll talk about is by the numbers. Um, the numbers vary from source to source on, you know, who's in the workforce right now, uh, but there are some commonalities to be found. Um, and one thing I would caution you about is get ready to face your workforce to be changing. Um, the workforce is gonna be changing drastically as these final few traditionalists and these baby boomers start retiring um, and more and more millennials are coming into the picture if they decide to break that generation down and, and not call them necessarily millennials, but say we're going to make a, a difference and we're going to have, you know, generation Y and generation Z. We'll see when over time. But the rate of the exit um, is predicted not to keep up with the rate of entrance. Um, so there's, there's some things that we as employers um, and company leaders need to be thinking about. Um, traditionalists, um, this is one uh, report that I found, make up 2% of our current workforce. Uh, baby boomers, we're looking at 29%. Generation X, 34%, and millennials, 35%. 
Um, and by 2020, which is just in, you know, really honestly three short years, we're at the end of 2016 now, it's believed that millennials will, um, you know, comprise at least 50% of the workforce. Um, so it's very important for us to understand how we can recruit the talent from all generations, but, you know, even more so millennials. How can we attract them to our companies? <clears throat> Okay, so this graph I thought was interesting because just in a quick view, you can look at 2005 and the millennials is represented in the darker blue. And um, you can see that they made up a, a, right, a little bit above 20% and by 2020, they're gonna be, um, of course, the one study I just shared with you said 50% or more of the workforce. So we are talking from 2005 to 2015 that the millennials in the workforce have more than doubled. And what is the next 15 years gonna look like? Even more so. Um, the next slide is, uh, it contains a lot of very good and useful information. Um, I really enjoyed it. I'm not gonna try to read everything to you. Of course, the numbers are a little different. As I shared with you, it showed that, uh, that the millennials made up 34% of the workforce where this one's saying Generation X is 35, so it has a little higher. And then it's breaking the millennials down into Generation Y and Generation Z. But it's talking about for the traditionalist, um, you know, the, the automobile was the, the big, great new thing that came along. And then when the baby boomers, it was the television. And then with the Generation Xers, it was the personal computer. It was having all this computing availability at your fingertips. And then, um, you know, now with the, the millennials, it's the tablet and the smartphone. You're able to carry a personal computer, much less a television, and even some cars, you can command them to start using your tablet or your, your smartphone um, to do your pre-warm. So just look at how far we've come. The technological differences, of course, are gonna mean generational differences in their mindsets. So thought that this was very interesting. I encourage you when you receive the PowerPoint to take a few minutes and look at that. Um, let's see, I did have a note um, on here that thing that the, the millennials are very compassionate about the world which they live in. Carbon footprint, um, the quality of their life, the using more than is necessary are big concerns to them. Um, so these are things that we're gonna see um, adjusting the way we work and the world we live in and the world we work in over time. Um, they want to do something that they love and they're going to be willing to sacrifice money um, to be passionate about their work. So that's, that's just something I did want to share with you. The next slide is a repeat um, of a previous slide. Lost my mouse. And I just added a note at the bottom that says, you know, our traditionalists are currently over 70, our baby boomers are between 56 and 70 years old. So you can see 31% of the population is made up, of population in the workforce is made up of baby boomers and traditionalists. Um, so over the next, next 15 years in the US, we're gonna be replacing probably at least 25% of this group of folks. Um, so are you ready? You ready to replace those people? That's where we're going to go with this next slide. We're going to get to how to recruit. Um, you know, I, I think developing a recruiting plan is strategically important for your company. You need to evaluate um, your company for and your workforce for key roles. Who's in what roles and where do we have a talent shortage within our company that we need to be looking to find the right talent to fill these roles? So succession planning is huge. Um, if you don't have succession planning in your organization, I encourage you to get with your, your leadership, start thinking about those key roles. Who do you have that you can start mentoring? If you don't have those people, start looking for the skills and the talent to bring in for those roles. Because we are about to see, you know, many, many, uh, researchers have, have referred to it as a mass exodus in our um, workforce when the baby boomers do retire, which some have started retiring. <clears throat> um, you're going to want to make sure that when you're recruiting, you're being mindful of generational preferences. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. 
Um, you know, you're going to have to determine how you want to reach the masses. There's so many ways available to recruit now through print, online, social platforms. Um, and you're going to want to make sure that you're engaging your current star players. You guys have heard birds of a feather flock together. So you're going to want to make sure still to this day, your number one uh, way to recruit is from your internal talent. It's from referrals. It's from your brand. It's from your reputation on the streets. That's how you get the people in the door. So it's very important to make sure that you're engaging your current employees into um, your recruit recruitment strategy. You need to be very clear on your expectations. I can't stress this enough coming from a, a staffing, um, not to harp on any employers, but if you don't know what you want, how does a job seeker know what you want? So you've got to be very clear on what this role is, what this position entails, what you need, what are the, the skills that's going to make for a successful person? Where are you willing to wiggle? What skills are you willing to compromise to get this other skill? Start thinking about before you look at, at recruiting for a position, what you really truly need. Set your expectations. Make sure you communicate those expectations to your candidates so that they understand um, and you're not having that open, revolving turnstile of employees. Um, of course, then you're going to want to implement your plan and then you're going to want to measure your results and revise your plan. Recruiting is an ongoing strategy. I know for us at Work, when we, we realize we invest in something and it didn't work the way we wanted, we got to come back to the table, decide on something different and go at it from a different angle. We got to hit it from different sides. So <clears throat> I said I would talk a little bit further about being inclusive of generational preferences. And these are a few notes that I came up with. Um, honestly, thinking in my mind of traditionalist baby boomers, uh, generation Xers moving on down to millennials. So I want to tell you, if your job doesn't require computer knowledge, think about keeping the process manual. Um, you know, you, if, if you're going to have someone finishing concrete um, and they are never going to have to use a computer, you may want to think about paper applications for those folks. Um, because a computer may not be where their skills are and, and where their trades are. So just think about um, how you're asking folks to apply and what the positions are you're asking them to apply for. Um, if you have blanket policies for must apply online, I, I urge you to reconsider those. Consider exceptions. You know, if, if someone wants to completely, I, I encourage everyone to have online, online platforms because of course as the millennials are going to become the predominant generation in the workforce, that's how they want to apply for your positions. But I encourage you to um, not limit your, your options um, from some of the, the other generations that may not be as comfortable with technology. Um, offer various options for interviews. Um, I, I participated not long into a, a Skype interview and it was great. It was easy, it was seamless, it was wonderful. So I really think that we have to start looking at opportunities. Um, you know, when you're talking to a candidate and you're offering them an interview, you may say, what works best for you? Do you want to do this as a phone interview? Do you want to come into my office? Do you have the availability to set up Skype or do you want to FaceTime? If you have these options open, allow your job seeker. If you really need that talent, you really need that candidate, allow them the option to kind of tell you what works best for them because different generations are going to respond to that different ways and different knowledge and skills are going to respond to you in different ways as well. Go mobile. Um, you're going to want to make sure that you double check your website and your online application. Um, make sure it's optimized for mobile use. Um, I have it on later in the presentation, but um, essentially there's been studies that show if someone's looking for a job, they will click three times. If they cannot complete your process in three times, they're done. They're off. So you got three clicks to complete. Um, if you don't have a process where you can have three clicks to complete, I encourage you to have a meter. Um, you know, you may see on some of the processes that you're doing five step meters, or you may have 20%, uh, 40%, 60%, 80%, 100% complete as they click through the process. I encourage you to have a meter like that to keep some of your folks from dropping off. Um, if they don't know how long this process is going to go on and they feel like it's a waste of their time, three clicks, they're done. Um, let's see. Consider remote onboarding, testing, and training. I have to tell you that there's a call center that I've worked with um, 
for many years, and I actually hosted and proctored their, their testing for their candidates, um, and they went mobile with that because they saw an increase in their, their candidates, the people willing to take the testing in order to determine if they're a candidate and they would be given an opportunity for an interview, they had to complete this testing. When they were given the option to do this testing remotely, the number of candidates that actually followed through greatly increased. So whatever you can do within your process to make it easier and remote for your candidates, then you're gonna to wanna to do that. Um, I'll tell you as well, my husband works at Eastman. He was hired five years ago. Um, five years ago, their onboarding was completely remote. He signed in with a username and password at home. He completed his W-4, all of his onboarding through their online process. So you're gonna wanna make, in order to get the best talent, you've gotta let them fill it out at three o'clock in the morning if they want to. You've gotta make it as convenient as possible for the people that you want to bring into your organization. Okay, most importantly, I would say be flexible to be inclusive. Resist, this is our process. If you tell a job seeker, this is their process, this is what your next step is, chances are they may just look elsewhere. So be resistant to that phrase. I encourage you to be resistant to that phrase. And some of these things that work needs to learn from too. I hope they're listening. All right. Um, no, we, we have good processes, but I, I can tell you as an organization, I think every company needs to take looks at where you can improve, where you can streamline, and how you can make things easier. So and this not was every five or ten years, right? Like not every five or years. ten years. Constantly yeah. changing. Gotcha. Constantly changing. Thank you. All right, so this was taken from an article by um, Catherine Byers Breit. The top ten candidate complaints, and I just want to, to leave this um, here for you to kind of think about and touch on. Ask yourself, start each one of these complaints with a question. Um, is your online application process painful? Does your compensation stink? Is your hiring process awful? Did you follow up? Uh, did you take too long to offer the position? If you took too long to offer the position, they found a job somewhere else. I, I can tell you that. Um, was your process all about you? Or did you talk to me about what you're going to bring me? Did you talk to me about the continuing education opportunities, the opportunities for advancement, the insurance, the time off that I'm gonna earn to spend with my family? Did you talk to me about what's in, in this role for me or did you talk to me about why I am gonna be a valuable resource for you? Don't make it all about you, make it about your candidate as well. Um, <clears throat> your interviewing skills are rotten or non-existent. Um, they're judging us on how we interview. So we, we need to be thinking about how we're engaging that candidate throughout our interviewing process. Um, you know, some companies have a no feedback. I'm sorry you didn't get the position, and I'm not gonna tell you why. Um, that no feedback policy is not working, and actually there are candidates going to social media, going to Glassdoor, going to Google review, reviews, going on these online platforms when a job seeker wants to to engage in an opportunity at your company, they go on there, they start Googling, they start looking to see what they can find out about your company. And if they start seeing that they've got two or three opportunities to weigh and there's some terrible reviews about you and your no, no feedback policy, then they're gonna probably go seek the opportunities with the other company first. Um, this is probably where I would have put number one. If your reputation stinks, and that is, not just in the community, but that's online as well. And I know there's some things that you can't do. People get online and they use it as a sounding board and they hide behind, um, you know, this, I don't know, online persona or, or whatnot. They don't put their real name with it. There's not a lot that you can do about that. But on the other hand, if you're engaging your current talent, your superstar players to be, um, you know, run a campaign, gamify what you are doing, to ask them to engage with survey reviews, um, with Glassdoor reviews, with Google reviews, um, so that you can kind of get some of those five-star ratings as well that's going to offset some of your other ratings. <clears throat> so your reputation, it does matter in the immediate community, the folks you interact with day-to-day, -day, but it also matters online, um, so keep that in mind. And it's very um, complained about if your recruiters don't understand the job. 
If the person you've got calling to talk to candidates about jobs don't understand that role and what that day-to-day -day role is, there's gonna be some disconnect. And the, the candidates and the job seekers do not enjoy that. So I would encourage you to have your hiring manager, your frontline supervisor, or someone like that to be engaged in that process. Um, in my opinion, for what it's worth, when you're thinking about um, you know, how to recruit, I would say be flexible. Ask for candidates preferred method of communication. I would tell you that with every generation, every touch needs to be thoughtful and respectful. Um, candidates want the three clicks to submit. We talked about that. Follow up with every lead. That is critical to follow up with every lead that you have. Um, even if you don't have something for them, you're, you're building your company's brand by contacting. You want to re-engage previous candidates. You want to be available and accessible. And human touch points are a priority for all. Um, you know, that's the very next slide is one of my favorite quotes of all time. And that is, you know, people will forget, sorry, you can't see it very well. People will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And this is with your job seeker. If you told them no on this position, that's okay. They've heard no before. They're going to be okay. But how you made them feel is going to determine whether they tell someone else to come apply with your company when they have an opportunity. All right, so the, the next topic that we're going to recover, or cover is where to recruit. Um, and, and this was something that I, I do have some very specific at work slides that I wanted to share with you as well. But just some, some ideas to throw out for you. Um, again, word of mouth, your reputation, how well your employees like working at your company is generally your number one method for recruitment. Um, employees, like I've mentioned, are taken to social media more and more to discuss their jobs. Be aware of your online branding. Um, in social media, uh, you got Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. I want to tell you that I recommend that companies make a very intentional decision about whether they are going to allow these social media platforms to be where they brand their company or where they advertise their company. There's a big difference in posting the jobs that you have open on social media and posting the latest award that your company received for its efforts in the community, or you reaching your goal for the uh, Relay for Life or whatever your, you know, if you have charitable events that you, you sponsor. So you might want to think about and make a very intentional decision. Am I going to use social media for building my brand or am I going to use social media for, um, recruitment, posting my jobs, um, you know, and, and you can make a, di a difference between Facebook and LinkedIn. You may decide that LinkedIn is going to be where you post to build your brand, whereas Facebook is where you're going to advertise because your employees share that with their friends, work gets out quicker, things like that. Um, then we have the traditional print, newspapers, billboards, flyers, and the such. Paid online job boards, um, those are Career Builder, Monster, and Deed. Then you have, um, you know, unpaid job boards. Facebook even has some job boards that you can request to become members of, and you can post your positions there. Sometimes communities have uh, community sites where you can post different things going on in the community. Sometimes you can post your jobs there. Uh, Craigslist is free in most cases, but it does cost in some areas. There's paid online ads. Um, you can pay Google for people that search jobs in Abingdon so that you come up with an ad on their site. So there's all kinds of paid online advertising that you can do. There's also the traditional state employment resources, the VEC, the Tennessee, the jobsfortn.gov. Um, there's community job fairs. Um, educational institutions is a great resource. I highly recommend having um, relationships, involvement with the career centers at the high schools, the universities, and the trade schools. <clears throat> Those are great places to recruit. Um, and just keep in mind you're building your company brand in the community even when you're not hiring. So don't expect that, okay, now that I'm hiring, I need to get out in the community. No, you should have been doing that six months ago. Your brand in the community matters now, not when you're hiring. 
Okay, these are some numbers that were specific to at work, and this was the latest data that I could get my hands on. I'm sorry you can't see this very well, but these are numbers from October of 2014 through, um, I'm sorry, November of 2014 through October of 2015. These are where our applicants came from. Among the at work offices that we had, um, at this point there was 21,000 applicants that came in. Um, if you consider friend referrals, client referrals, walk-ins, and then this 9% that just came to us and we're not really sure where they came from, that's probably based on you know, your, your brand awareness and your uh, referrals from employees, referrals from clients and such. We had 60% of our applicants come to us from those methods. So still, the number one way that you are gonna be um, successful in your recruitment strategy across generations is word of mouth. Um, but the, the internet, 33%, and I have a slide that's gonna break that down a little further. You can see that the traditional print, um, you know, billboards, what are we looking at there? 1% mail flyers, 1%, uh, newspaper, 2%. So really, it's word of mouth and internet at this point for our organization. Um, and I appreciate Scott Moorfield as our marketing manager and he provided me with these slides, so I'd like to uh, thank him for that. Of the internet um, applicants that we received, you know, we, we invest quite a bit of money into our different resources. Um, so for us, here is where some of our um, applicants came from, just so you can see. There's, you know, Career Builder, Craigslist, Facebook, Google, Indeed, LinkedIn, Monster, Snag a Job, Twitter. So this is internet and social media sites, paid and non-paid, um, just to give you an idea. Okay, so finally, the role of retention and engagement. Um, you know, I really encourage you to put some stock into your retention strategy. Um, the well may run dry on you. And if you have a strategy that is, well, if they leave, I'll find another one, um, that, that's not gonna suit you well. You're, you're, we are running into a situation where we're gonna have less and less people to replace those leaving the workforce. Um, so I encourage you to look very closely at retention. And we'll talk just for a moment about that. I recently did a presentation on employee engagement and retention. Um, so I took some expert excerpts from that um, PowerPoint to put into this one. But there are three main factors that drive your employee retention, and I would encourage you to, to do an analysis of your organization on these three factors as well. Um, to encourage your retention, which will encourage your word of mouth, which will get you more referrals, which will help you with your recruiting process. So pride in the organization, uh, belief in senior leadership, and satisfaction with immediate manager. Those are the three main factors that drive employee retention. Um, so ask yourself these questions. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to pride in the organization, and this is m probably most important to um, the millennials coming up, they want to be proud of where they're working, who they're representing, um, and the, the job that they're doing. It's very important for them to bring value to the table. If they're in a position where they don't feel like they're being valuable or they're being underutilized, they're gonna leave and they're gonna find something else and they're probably not gonna call you to tell you, they're just gonna go. Um, so, do our employees understand our mission statement and our corporate vision? Do they believe in our product and service? Do our employees understand our commitment to our customers? Does our company make efforts to serve our communities and the world we live and work in? So ask yourself these questions and evaluate um, where you stand and what you can do different. It is your job to communicate with the employees um, on all of these topics. <clears throat> if they're proud, they're gonna tell others. So belief in senior leadership. How does leadership make decisions? Um, are the employees involved in organizational and operational change? Is their concern for employee health and well-being reflected by senior leadership? This is more and more important. Um, as you can see with Google, you know, there's the outdoor space and the, uh, the different areas where folks can go to, um, per se, have their break so they can come back and, and re-engage in the work process. So they, employees are going to want to know more and more that senior leadership cares about their health and their well-being. 
Um, how does senior leadership pay it forward? They're looking for ways that you contribute. Um, as, as a corporate structure, they're gonna wanna see that there's contributions made to causes that they care about, or at least to causes. Um, they're gonna wanna be involved in that process as well. So they're gonna wanna see companies paying it forward. Satisfaction with immediate manager. Um, this is the last topic, but it's probably the most important. I'm sure you guys have heard that people don't leave companies, they leave managers. Um, that is pretty much most uh, true um, among any study that I've ever read or any, any topic that I've ever heard spoke on. Um, it has been that the satisfaction with the immediate manager is your number one retention strategy. Um, so you're gonna need to look, how does your managers lead? Can you coach them? Can you offer your leaders um, you know, better leadership skills? How does the manager communicate? Um, you know, remember that with the Generation Xers and the Millennials, they want that constant feedback. They want to hear how they're doing. Um, so that's something that, that your managers, you know, baby boomers are a little uncomfortable with conflict. So they may be a little resistant to give that feedback. So you're going to want to make sure that, that you are encouraging communication among all generations, um, respectful communication. <clears throat> Um, how are ideas and suggestions pushed through by the manager? Um, I can tell you that there's gonna, there is always the need for um, self-preservation and um, you know that was my idea, let's see where it goes. A manager needs to understand to come back and allow that to circle back to that employee that this was their idea, this was their innovative thinking that pushed this idea forward. Um, how's the manager's follow-up and reliability? Can they count on their manager? Is their manager going to get back to them the way that, that they expect and need them to get back to them? Remember with millennials, it's immediacy. They want that answer right away. They don't want to sit around and wait on it. <clears throat> um, does the manager assign tasks that utilize strengths? Or does this manager capitalize and magnify what their weaknesses are? You know, give, give those tasks that may be difficult for one person to someone else, allow the strengths within your team to be capitalized on. Um, I understand you can't take work away that's responsible for people, but you can maybe assign that as a group project if it's something that, that's very difficult. Um, but if you magnify weaknesses, um, folks will leave. That, that will not benefit your retention strategy. Um, does the manager look for opportunities to grow individual talents of the team? I think that's very important and I think here is where also um, we have a due diligence to have a succession plan in place to have that career pathing uh, coming into play where you're talking to your employees about where they can go where they need to grow you know this is an area that you know I really want you to focus on because here's where I see that leading you here's where I see this leading you um, so we need to, to be very uh, intentional with communicating with their immediate managers air succession and career pathing plan. Okay, um, just some other statistics, um, and this one will come back to the generations. Um, statistically speaking, we have a, a workforce that is 30% fully engaged, 50% partially engaged, and 20% disengaged, and that's according to Gallup. And I wanted to give you this next slide just because we were talking about the generations and the workforce um, to kind of think on. If uh, you look here, the actively disengaged is represented in black. The not engaged or um, you know, partially engaged is represented in light green. And the fully engaged workers are represented in your, your green, your dark green. Your engaged workers are where your ideas come from, they're where your innovation come from. They're your thought leadership group. They're the people that are pushing these ideas forward. They're gonna receive the highest scores on your customer service rating. Um, they, they are the ones that are going to go above and beyond. So looking at this generally, generationally speaking, um, according to Gallup, the traditionalists and the millennials have the highest levels of workforce engagement. I'll let, you get, let that sink in. Your traditionalists and your millennials are the population that have the highest percentage of, of engagement into the workforce. And um, I have to say in my experience, I see a lot of fresh ideas and, and technology introductions from the millennial generation. And I think that they reflect one of the lowest numbers 
of disengagement because if you are not allowing them to blossom and spread their wings, um, then they are going to leave. They have no reservations about moving on to the next opportunity. Um, I had the pleasure of hearing Seth, Mad Seth Madison speak, um, and according regarding how the workforce is changing, um, those born in 1980 and thereafter want transparency and immediacy, and we talked a little bit about that. Um, statistics have shown that the millennials will leave if they lose interest or they feel undervalued. Therefore, they're not sticking around to spread the negativity and bring your workforce down. Um, unfortunately, baby boomers show the highest number of actively disengaged employees. Um, and, and you know, I think sometimes that's a result of technology introductions. As we see the workforce changing and we see more technology being introduced, um, you know, that can kind of create some hard feelings for someone that doesn't truly understand. So then that creates some negativity. Ah, something else for me to have to learn. Something else for me to have to do. So that, I think, may contribute to why you have the highest number of actively, and that, that's just my perception, no numbers to indicate that's the, the real reason. But I think that may be why you see the highest number of actively disengaged um, among baby boomers. Okay, so where are we going? I'm gonna talk some craziness to you now. Um, first, first few, not so much, but the next few, I think that, um, you know, it is the way that, that we're changing some things to be looking forward to. And you're going to remember um, this crazy girl in, in Abingdon at the, the Virginia Highlands um, lunch hour, the new knowledge hour, telling you that this is the way we were going. And you're going to be like, man, she knew what she was talking about. I hope, I hope that you can say that anyway. All right, so we have um, companies that are now starting internal jobs training programs, apprenticeship programs. I think that these are gonna be very valuable for the way that we move work forward in the future. Um, I encourage you to develop apprenticeship programs. I was talking to a site selection firm yesterday from Dallas um, about a company that's looking to move into Sullivan County. And he asked me if there was a skill or a trade that's particu particularly hard to locate in our, our area. And I told him maintenance technicians, um, highly automated maintenance technicians, folks with four phase electrical knowledge um, and CNC programming. Those are some of the hardest positions that we find to fill. He said, that's not a problem to our area. That's a problem to the nation. Um, so if your company requires or your organization requires some type of skill where you are, you are seeing that there is a true skills gap then I encourage you to go back and brainstorm, get a couple millennials involved, and think about internal jobs training. What type of apprenticeships can you do in-house that will help you fill your skills gap? Um, the next is flex crews. Um, this, this is something that is, it, it's not new to service industries because there's been schedules and you can let your manager know when you can work, when you can't work, and they put you on the schedule and things like that. This is going to have to be the way that we start thinking about all of our jobs. How can we fill the hours that we need to fill, but not require someone to be here Monday through Friday from 8 to 5, or not require someone to be here on second shift from 3 to 11? How can we change the way we look at this to say, we're gonna allow flexible hours and schedules. You pick what you can work. You know, maybe it needs to be a rating system and the, you know, the top rated employees pick what they want first. The second level employees pick what they want next. I, I don't know how it's gonna work. I don't have the solution. If I did, you know, it'd be awesome. But um, we're gonna have to start thinking about flex crews and that goes to job sharing. Um, and job sharing is something that I'm, I'm very interested in and learning a lot about, um, you know, maybe, for job sharing, um, myself and Donna and Susan have similar skills, and we decide that we're going to go work, go to work at the same company. That company needs somebody there 50 hours a week. Well, between myself and Susan and Donna, we go through the training. We all become employees, and we share the responsibility of that 50 hours a week. Between the three of us, we're going to be there for those hours that are required, but it may not be all three of us there at the same time and we're gonna carry on each other's work throughout the day. So you're gonna have, or throughout each allocation of hours that we work. 
So you're going to have this job sharing concept. How can different people share the same job <clears throat> to work with what, what, what works with their life? Artificial intelligence replacing current jobs. Um, you know, I'm sure that, that you guys have seen there's some, now some robots that can perform surgeries. Um, you know, we are in the, in the age where we are talking about, you know, technology advancing so much so that artificial intelligence is going to replace some jobs. Where we are with the, you know, as I referred to earlier, mass exodus of baby boomers that's impending, maybe that's not a bad thing. Um, because we're going to need technology to advance air processes. Um, so maybe your next replacement is software or machine that you're going to need to invest in. Um, the next is technology advancements for job seekers. Um, I, I actually have a call today at 4 o'clock and I've talked to two companies so far that are built on the Uber type platform. Um, and what this is, is on demand, a company can say, I need a worker today from this time to this time and you're going to be doing this and they need to wear this. They load it onto the app, the app goes out to the job seekers, which in my case will be our at work employees, and they'll be able to sign up and take that job. And on demand, I have the talent that I need to fill the shift that I have opened. So uh, that is the, the Uber mentality of work. And I think that we're gonna see that coming along um, very, very, very quickly in the near future. Um, <clears throat> for nursing, I think it would be fantastic. For nursing, for hospitality, for uh, retail, for several different things. If you can load what shifts you have open into an app, it gets a push notification just like you get the little ding on your phone that you have a Facebook alert. They can go on and say, oh yeah, I can work that shift. Click on it, they're ready to go. They have what they need. Um, so we're talking about Uber platform for work. I think that's coming. Crowdsourcing. Um, <laughs> I think that this is going to be the way that we are going to find talent, especially for hard to fill skilled positions in the future. Um, you know, we already have uh, Priceline and Progressive, where we go on and we say we want a flight from Tri-Cities to San Diego. You tell me your best price. When we have someone that has a highly sought after skill or talent, I think they're going to be able to go on and I think employers are going to pay to have access to the service to say I need a maintenance technician with four phase electrical knowledge and CNC programming or whatever the requirements are and the highest bidder will be able to, to obtain that talent. I do think that we're looking at, at that type of progression of our workforce especially as the skills gap tends to widen. Um, and then finally, freelance work. Um, we're seeing more and more, um, you know, especially among IT, this has been common for quite some time, that developers um, and um, software writers and um, even um, freelance writers and things like that. We've seen freelance for a long time, but I think that we're gonna see more and more freelancers enter the workforce with this millennial group because they're able to own their career, which is their mentality. So that is where I think we are going. And now I have open time for other ideas or what's working for you. And just want to remind you that always, according to Robert Frost, your best way out is always through. So meet your diversion head on, whatever the obstacles are in your workforce, challenge them directly, engaging all workforces. I will send them to Jennifer, and Jennifer will send them out to the attendees. Thank you, Mary. It's a great presentation. We really appreciate it. And like I said before, this is our last uh, topic for 2016. We'll pick up the new knowledge series. Um, January 18th, Business on the Map with Google. So we hope you will join us then in 2017. Um, some other things that's going on, we have our Entrepreneur Express that's going to be tomorrow night here at the incubator. And we'd love for you, if you know somebody that can attend that, we'd love for you to come to that. 
don't know if a lot of you know about our Washington County Business Challenge. Our fourth year is going to start January the 24th, it's going to run through February the 28th. This is a great opportunity if you know someone that's got a startup business or an existing business. We've got um, two, well, three, three prizes and their money prizes. The first one is $5,000 for an existing, $5,000 for um, a startup, $1,500 in both categories, and a $500. We'll be, um, the, the winners will be announced at the Chamber's March meeting, which will be March the 16th. So please get, get the information out. Um, you can pick up the information off the Chamber's website. And I just want to say that as one of the partners, we're certainly glad to have all of you. And we look forward to working with you. And that's what we're here for. Thank you for coming. I'm going to go get my stuff.